Welcome to the Rabbi Daniel Lappin Show, where I, your rabbi, reveal how the world really works. That's my function, and it is with that in mind, with that solemn commitment of revealing how the world really works, that I welcome all of you happy warriors, you eager devotees of the Rabbi Daniel Lappin Show. You're all happy warriors because in my mind, you're either a beautiful nubile woman or a handsome virile man, regardless of your condition. No gender spectrum, no confusion. You're just male happy warriors and female happy warriors. This is because this show focuses as much or more on our souls as on our bodies. And we, all of us, every listener, has a young and vibrant soul. What is more, we're all happy warriors because to live productively, you've got to fight every day against the forces of entropy, if nothing else. You fight to maintain your possessions. You fight to build and maintain your family and your money. You, you fight to maintain your body, your business, your profession, or your career. Life is a fight, and that's a good thing. To stop fighting, seeking, striving, <laughs> well, that's just to die. And you're not just warriors, but you're happy warriors, because to throw yourself into the fight for eight or ten hours a day, six days a week, well, that's one thing. But to do all that with a debonair smile on your face and a jaunty pace to your stride, to do all that while generating an irrepressible surge of happiness welling up in your soul, well, that means you are spiritually grounded in everything that is life-affirming, but it also probably means that you love music, all kinds of music, because music has the ability to make us feel happy. Happiness is a spiritual condition, and music is a spiritual quantity. And yes, uh, there's obviously different kinds of music. Uh, Music without words is a higher form of music than music with words. So uh, popular music that is words and poems set to lyrics is a lower form of music than pure music where the music itself conveys the sentiment. Generally, that takes a little longer. And so symphonic music, classical symphonic music, where you may have to listen for 30 minutes to catch a full symphony and and get the idea and, and capture the emotion and the feeling coming across. Well, not everyone can do that. And so uh, after a little while, opera emerged. And People looked down their their noses when opera came out because it wasn't pure music. It was music with uh, essentially words and action on the stage. So almost anybody could get it without even any concentration powers at all. And then we came to popular music with with lyrics on everything. Uh, You've also got um, uh, music that is essentially set to the rhythmic sexual thump of a bass section. And then you've got much more subtle music, which is set in the the treble register. Uh, There's there's different kinds of music. Obviously, there's no question about that. Uh, The Greek philosopher Plato said, music gives a soul to the universe. All right. Um, Albert Einstein said, if I were not a physicist, I would probably be a musician. I often think in music. I live my daydreams in music. I see my life in terms of music. That was Einstein. Uh, uh, William Shakespeare, of course, famously, if music be the food of love, play on. Give me excess of it. That surfeiting, that appetite may sicken, etc., etc. Okay, fine. Uh, At any rate, yeah, music is obviously something that I'm sure plays a part in your lives. And if it doesn't, then you really ought to think about ways to do that. In other words, uh, are there ways you could be listening to music while you commute or while you work or while you exercise or while you walk the dog? 
Uh, I'm not a dog walker, so I don't know if that violates any form of fundamental dog walking protocol. I hope not. But um, at any rate, uh, I will play for you um, another little piece. What you listened to as we came into the show today um, was a young a concert pianist. She's about 30 years old. Her name is Yuja Wang. And uh, she was playing Rachmaninoff's second piano concerto. I mean, obviously, I just played you uh, nine or ten seconds of it. But uh, it was enough for you to hear, I think, a certain virtuosity in her performance. Uh, listen to Beethoven's Sonata Number no. Twenty Nine again. Only a few seconds, just enough to give you the flavor. And I leave it to your imagination to see in your mind's eye what her fingers must be doing. And as a matter of fact, when you hear the power and the passion coming through as she plays the piano, you could actually imagine what her whole body is doing. She's really bringing down all her power on the keys. She's not a big woman, obviously, uh, but that's what she does. And uh, you can hear that right now. This is a few seconds of uh, Beethoven's uh, Sonata Number 29. Well, you get the idea, right? And um, the the thing that is interesting is that she uh, became quite controversial, and I want to talk about the aspects of the controversy. So what we do is uh, we're going to go to um, a music reviewer of the Los Angeles Times. Um, his name is uh, Mike Swed, I think. I think that's his name. Uh, no, my, not Mike. Mark. Sorry, Mark Swed. And he's talking about a performance <clears throat> of her playing uh, the uh, second piano concerto by Prokofiev. So lis listen to this. This is how his review goes in the Los Angeles Times. Dressed in a strapless, snug, sparkling gown with a black zipper down her back, Tuesday night, Yu Jia Wang has clearly become the belle of the bowl. Ever since her Hollywood bowl debut four years ago, wearing a short skirt that became a fashion statement in classic music circles at any rate, audiences expect that the 28-year-old Chinese pianist will be a dazzling presence the moment she walks on stage. High-def monitors at the Hollywood Bowl also help. And then he goes on to talk about her electrifying performance of Prokofiev's second piano concerto. Um, and and it, it is rather remarkable, as a matter of fact. Uh, how about we take uh, another 10 seconds of that right now? <laughs> See what I mean. So uh, that was Mike Swed uh, writing about her second performance at the bowl. And he says, snug, sparkling, strapless gown with a black zipper down her back. You, Some of you who've been with me here on the Rabbi Daniel Appen show for a while uh, might remember me talking about very visible zippers on women's clothing. I will refresh your memory in just a moment. But first of all, what we need to do is uh, hear some more of the review. Now we go to uh, Los Angeles Times music critic Mark Swed writing about Yu Jia Wang's first performance at the Hollywood Bowl four years earlier than the one I just read you. And um, here he writes... 
the pianist Yu Jia Wang broke no public decency laws when she appeared as soloist in Rachmaninoff's Piano Concerto No. 3 at the Hollywood Bowl in a little orange dress two weeks ago. But from the response of the audience, gasps, wolf whistles, and popping flashes, and the heated reactions to my descriptions of the concert that have been percolating through the blogosphere, the burden has not been lifted. The dress was short, tight, and stylish. Wang's heels were high. She's 24, and she's had fashion magazine spreads. Had she walked the Academy Awards red carpet in this outfit, she would have been noticed. She looked great. She also played impressively under the circumstances. Her heels didn't hurt her pedaling. Her fingers flew across the keyboard with startling speed, power, and accuracy. So what's the big deal? Well, partially was the surprise when Wang played with the LA Philharmonic two years ago. She wore a long red, gra- uh, long red gown and so on and so forth. But his review was a mix of the music, uh, Yu Jia Wang's piano playing virtuosity and her clothing. But the story doesn't end there. Now, here comes Mark Swed's review written a few weeks earlier than the last thing I read you. This review appeared uh, a day or two after Yu Jia Wang's uh, first appearance at the Hollywood Bowl. And um, here he writes, uh, It was Yu Jia Wang's orange dress, for which Tuesday night is likely to be remembered. The Chinese pianist who opened the concert with Rachmaninoff's third piano concerto is already a star. Um, on, she is quoted as saying that her album reflects the endless transformations in life and music. Endless transformations indeed, says Mark Swed. Her latest life transformation is in the direction of startling glamour. Her dress on Tuesday night was so short and so tight that had there been any less of it, the bowl might have been forced to restrict admission to any music lover under 18 not accompanied by an adult. Had her heels been any higher, walking to say nothing of her sensitive pedaling would have been unfeasible. The infernal helicopters that brazenly buzz the bowl seemed on this night like long net paparazzi wanting a good look. Yes, she is beautiful. Yes, that is some makeover. Yes, she's still the same tasteful, technically impeccable, confident, and extraordinary pianist she was when she first appeared somewhat more modestly with the Los Angeles Philharmonic in 2009. And then he carries on and uh, speaks about how she delivered the Rachmaninoff Concerto Number no. 3 and uh, her amazing playing, and it's, it's all, you know, it's, it's, I found it an interesting review. But I wasn't surprised that people went nuts because uh, how dare he draw attention to her appearance? Would he have done the same to a male pianist? Does Mark Swed ever describe a male pianist as wearing an impeccable black tuxedo which shocked the audience? No, of course not. Because, ladies and gentlemen, men and women are different. And... uh, I want to tell you that the word sexism means less than the word unicorn. At least I can describe to you the popular perception of what a unicorn is. But sexism means absolutely nothing at all. Sexism is the high-pitched screech of the left, like fingernails on a chalkboard. Uh, Anytime anybody makes an observation having to do with the fact that men and women are different from one another, that men view women quite differently from the way women view men, and that there is an electrical tension between the two sexes. And so anybody who makes any observation touching on any of that is immediately described as sexist. And so now uh, I've got to read you just a little bit more And that is um, uh, a piece that appeared in the Washington Post round about this time. And this one is by a woman called Anne Midget. I suppose you should probably, to be less um, rude, it should be pronounced Midget, maybe. But uh, Anne Midget 
<laughs> uh, writes a piece slamming Mark Swed of the Los Angeles Times. Listen to her, her piece. Pianist Yuja Wang's dress at a concert this month at the Hollywood Bowl has given rise to considerable attention. Should critics review the dress? Should we comment on how classical stars look? On the one hand, appearance has no bearing on how an artist sounds. On the other hand, appearance sends a message. Christoph Eschenbach's Nehru-style jackets are a deliberate step away from the tradition-bound formality of an orchestra conductor's tales, and many younger conductors have followed suit, and it's certainly fair to comment on that when it seems warranted. And plenty of classical artists are now playing around more and more deliberately with the way they look. There's a third factor at play, though. When it comes to talking about women's clothes in the field of music, you see men have a uniform. They either wear formal clothing or daringly estuate. Women do not have a comparable uniform, in part because women's fashions are more varied, and in part because women didn't play a major role in classical performance in the years when these traditions were being codified. Yes, there were a handful of soloists, but for years there were few women, if any, in major symphony orchestras and virtually no female conductors. Female orchestra members and conductors still have to contend with the issue of what they should be wearing on a regular basis. The criticism of women's clothing on stage has been a red flag for me ever since Eve Queller said that when she started conducting in the late 1960s, her clothing so dominated her reviews that one critic complained that a zipper glinting on the back of her evening gown was distracting. This is obvious sexism! This is obvious sexism! This is obvious sexism! Unfortunately, the tenor of the discussion of women's attire in this field has retained more than a hint of the sexist tone. What should women wear on the concert stage? What is appropriate? A general rule of thumb appears to be that if it's sexy, it's probably not good. Indeed, it's almost automatically forms into the realm of cheesy pop-style classical crossover. And if it's revealing, it's worthy of a lot of comment. My particular beef is with Mark Swed in the Los Angeles Times who was evidently shocked or titillated by the dress Yuja Wang wore for her Hollywood Bowl appearance. Her dress Tuesday was so short and tight, he wrote, that had there been any less of it, the bowl might have been forced to restrict admission to any music lover under 18 not accompanied by an adult. Had her heels been any higher, walking to say nothing of a sense of peddling would have been unfeasible. This review and the dress that inspired it have prompted several responses and questions whether Wang should wear such a dress. Let's have a reality check for a minute. Yes, the dress is short, tight, and revealing. But in the real world, the world outside classical music's bubble, this is not unusual attire for a young rising starlet in the public eye. And then she goes on uh, to, to basically say, look, um... Uh, look at Lady Gaga, look at uh, women at fashion in fashion magazines. She doesn't make the point that uh, if somebody would show up at an office dressed the way Yu Jia Wang is dressed for some of these concerts, and yes, I fully realize that the uh, uh, those of you on the male end of the gender spectrum are frantically going to be YouTubing for Yu Jia Wang. And I think that's just fine, because you will, first of all, hear her playing, which is quite stupendous. It really is startlingly amazing. And, um, and yes, she is attractive, and, um, and she is not working in an office. This is, she is in the entertainment business. So is it a problem? Not for me, it isn't. Is it a problem for Mark Swed to comment on it? Of course not. And um, and when when Anne Majette um, complains that uh, one of the early female conductors, Eve Queller, said in the sixties that she was she wasn't happy that a uh, critic 
complained complained about a, a noticeable zipper on the back of her evening gown and uh, on one of the outfits worn by Yuja Wang there was also a very noticeable zipper uh, ladies I'm really sorry to tell you this but um, let me explain something to you I may not be an expert on women's fashions but I'm not a complete dummy I happen to know that there is a term concealed zipper. And so if you are a woman looking for a dress, which shall we say has a zip down the back, you can either choose to have that zipper invisible and concealed, in which case it has some material that flaps over it and has a hook at the back of the neck, I bet some of you ladies are pretty impressed with me now, right? I'm not a complete ignoramus, no matter what I look like. So um, you can opt, ladies, for an invisible zipper. But let me tell you something. If you opt for the other kind, and this is a fashion reality, they are out there, you can see them everywhere. Ladies, if you opt for a zipper that is large, very visible, conspicuous. It's it's a different. It's a it's it's a color that contrasts with the dress, and it even sometimes has a big round pull ring on the zipper, and that either runs down your back or down your front. Do you really need me to tell you that there is not a male between the age of fourteen and eighty that doesn't see that? and imagine peeling you out of your dress. I'm sorry, but that's a reality. And if you don't believe me, then you have absolutely no idea of the kind of imagination that God placed into the male human being. And so if this conductor had a zipper that was visible on the back of an evening gown, I promise you that was deliberate. You, you cannot possibly do that accidentally. If you're a conductor, a lady conductor, your back is going to be to the audience. You obviously spend a little time thinking about what you want the audience to see on the back. And if you decided it should be a zipper, then it's noticeable. And of course it'll be commented on it. Why shouldn't there? Why shouldn't it? And... Uh, uh, similarly, with Yu Jia Wang, who wore a uh, an outfit with a very visible zipper down the back, of course it's noticeable. Of course it's titillating. Of course, the overwhelming majority of men in the audience who saw it had imaginations racing in top gear, imagining peeling down that zipper. So I'm sorry, but it is quite different. This is not, oh, sexism. No, there's a difference between men and women. And nobody is going to talk about what a man looks like when he's conducting. No one's going to talk about what a man looks like when he's playing a uh, piano with an orchestra, playing a concerto. No, that isn't going to happen. But people are when we're talking about women. There's a huge difference between men and women. My friends, what women look like is much, much, much more important than anything else at first glance. I'm not saying when you choose a bride or when... No, if you're trying to hire an accountant and a woman comes with... Uh, superb accounting qualities, then you'd be quite right to say her, her appearance doesn't matter at all. But the very first thing that men and women notice about a woman is what she looks like. The very first thing and the most important thing about men is what they can achieve, what they can do, how they perform. This is very, very different. What women look like is really important. That's why there's a huge, huge industry catering to women's appearances. 
whereas the industry that caters to men's appearances is minuscule in comparison. It's invisible by comparison because appearance is very real for women when we all notice what a woman looks like. Very often, we may not notice what a man looks like if we're focused on what he's able to do, what his performance is. And that's why uh, even at a uh, at an intimate moment when masculine and feminine are uniting, even at that time, we're talking, and commonly we talk about performance. And when we speak about performance, we're speaking only about the male, because an essence of a man is his performance, what he achieves, what he does, the extent to which he moves the world. Dating websites tell you that uh, women are four to five times more likely to respond to a profile without a picture than men are. In other words, if a man is looking on the website, on a dating website for a woman, if there's no picture, he moves on. He won't read the description, but four to five times as many women will actually read a description of a man even if there is no picture. Makes perfect sense to me. I see it all the time, and I'm sure you do as well. This is how the world really works. May not be the way we want it to work. May not be the ideal we conjure up in our minds. But it is how the world really does work. And how about as a tribute to pianist Yu Jia Wang, who taught us, who teaches us with every one of her appearances, that the way a female entertainer dresses, particularly if she dresses strikingly or provocatively, uh, well, that is just as newsworthy, uh, or perhaps almost as newsworthy, as how well she plays the piano. So let's uh, listen to a few seconds of Yu Jia Wang playing the closing notes of Tchaikovsky's first piano concerto. You'll love it. Those were the last few seconds of Tchaikovsky's first piano concerto played by striking a concert pianist, Yu Jia Wang. And now to something linked, but uh, a little less cheerful. Turns out that in Beverly Hills, California, on the evening of uh, a summer evening in August, August 20th, 1989, an entertainment executive uh, called Jose Menendez and his wife Kitty, uh, were sitting in their den when their two teenage sons, Lyle and Eric, came in carrying shotguns. And Lyle and Eric, in cold blood, murdered their mother and their father with their shotguns. And um, the the brothers, uh, it, it, it took a while, it was so shocking and I was living in Los Angeles at the time, and I remember just how shocking this was to such an extent that quite a while, quite a long time went by uh, before the police arrested Lyle and Eric, just because it was so hard to believe. This was a golden family. The boys drove expensive sport cars. Uh, they had beautiful girlfriends. They were at expensive schools. It was just hard to believe, but uh, eventually they uh, they confessed. They it went to trial, and um, the trial I think was about ninety three. That gives you an idea of how much time elapsed, which is by the way a terrible thing. But uh, anyways, the uh, both bro brothers were convicted of first degree murder as well as conspiracy to commit murder. And uh, they were both sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. 
Um, there have been several attempts they've made. There have been appeals, but it, it was so um, shut and and tr- and dried. It was so clear what happened. Uh, it, it just wasn't, uh, it was never in doubt whatsoever. And in 98, uh, the Court of Appeals upheld the, the murder convictions. The Supreme Court of California upheld the convictions and the sentences. Uh, the Supreme Court de- 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 uh, declined to hear the case in, 19, in 1999. And um, they filed habeas corpus petitions in March 200, 2003. They were denied. Anyway, you get the idea. Um, it went to the United States Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals and again, uh, denial of uh, habeas corpus. And that's it. The brothers are going to be in prison. They just a little while ago were moved to the same prison. For a long time, they were in separate prisons. They, they were moved to the same prison. And that is pretty much uh, where they are going to spend the rest of their lives, I understand. Okay, why do I tell you that? Well, before I tell you why I tell you that, you'll pardon me if I tell you just a few other stories, equally horrible. And I'm sorry, this is not meant to bring you down at all, but uh, you can already start thinking about what do all these cases I'm telling you about, all these murder cases, they all have something in common, <laughs> which is really quite amazing and in keeping with the theme of today's show, which is please resist popular culture's attempt to persuade you that men and women are the same. Please resist political correctness trying to tell you that men and women are the same. Please resist academia, entertainment, uh, politics. Please resist all these cultural forces trying to tell you that men and women are the same. We're different, almost different species. And so now I want to tell you about a guy called Scott Peterson who lived in Northern California. And uh, he is going to die in San Quentin State Prison eventually. And uh, in 2004, he was convicted uh, in the first degree murder of his pregnant wife, uh, Lacey Peterson, and the second degree murder of their unborn son uh, in Modesto, California. Um, Again, this was um, uh, 2004, so it's not... Not that long ago, people, I'm sure people, particularly people who live around there, will remember the case. Um, You know, he, again, it took the police some time because it was so shocking. A beautiful wife with with expecting a child. He was, uh, he had a good job. It it was so impossible to understand. And they... um, uh, the police came up with the evidence. They found evidence in the, in the boat that he'd used to take the body out into San Francisco Bay. If I remember, listen, whatever, it's it's horrible. I don't want to I don't want to conjure up bad dreams or uh, or emphasize that. Bottom line is that um, I mean it it was it was just hard to believe that, that he didn't look like a murderer. His life was was normal. It just was so strange, but um, uh, eventually, one it, there was beyond a shadow of a doubt. Um, he uh, it went to trial, and uh, uh, he was he was found guilty. Um, a, a lot of there's a lot of evidence. It was just it was just terrible really really horrible and uh, eventually um he uh, was sentenced to life imprisonment in San Quentin and that's where he is uh why do i tell you this do you know the reason yet well i'll give you one or two other cases if you don't mind and then we'll we'll home in on what is in common to all of these cases okay so uh, the next story I tell you about is a guy called Ilyich Ramirez Sanchez, and he is serving not one, not two, but three life sentences in France. 
he's going absolutely nowhere. By the way, you might remember him by a slightly different name. Do you remember Carlos the Jackal? That's right, he was a Venezuelan communist who has since become a Muslim, and um, he uh, he was involved in the 1972 Munich massacre. Um, he His first life sentence was for a 1975 murder of a French government informant and two, two French agents. Um, he's been responsible for the death of hundreds and hundreds of, uh, of people around the world. And uh, he is, um, uh, by the way, I, I think, if I'm not mistaken, do you remember a, a terrific novelist by the name of Frederick Forsyth? He did a novel in the 1970s called The Day of the Jackal. And I I think that was, uh, there was sort of some link there. I think that was when he became uh, nicknamed Carlos the Jackal after after that novel, as, a, as opposed to the other way. I don't, I don't think that, uh, that Frederick Forsyth wrote the novel based on Carlos the Jackal's life. I think it was the other way around. But at any rate, uh, he grew up in a Marxist family, he uh, became a so-called revolutionary, turned Muslim, and he's now serving three life sentences in France. Um, so that was Carlos the Jackal, uh, Illich Ramirez Sanchez. While we're talking about Ramirez's, how about we also do Richard Ramirez? How about him? Well, uh, Richard Ramirez, you might remember as the Los Angeles Night Stalker. Uh, horrible, horrible stuff, Uh, lots and lots of cruel and callous murders and rapes in both Southern and Northern California, and uh, he eventually was uh, uh, put on California's death row, and once again, there was, there was little, little doubt about all the murders he had committed, it was, it was pretty well known, um, they caught him in 1985, in summer 1985, and uh, um, and I'm not sure exactly how. It doesn't matter. It's it's not it's not significant for the purpose of the things we're discussing today. But um, uh, again, you know, long long complicated trial, but uh, it it ended. He was convicted on um, I think about 18 counts of murder or attempted murder, uh, 11 rapes. It was unbelievable. Anyways, um, he, uh, uh, he was sentenced to die in, uh, by gas chamber in California. That was in 1989. By that time already, uh, California was, was not doing a whole lot of executions. And at any rate, uh, you know how the appeals things went. Uh, the appeal stuff go 1989 he's put in jail and 1990 1995 2000 2005 finally in summer 2006 um he's only his first round of Cal- appeals to the California court um ended unsuccessfully the California Supreme Court upheld his death sentence and uh they uh, denied his request for a retrial and meanwhile, he had plenty uh, more ap- appeals going. I mean, it's, you, it just goes on and on decade after decade after decade. Um, by 2013, he's still alive, filing appeals and cheating the gas chamber of its uh, rightful victim. And he finally died peacefully uh, from some sickness in uh, Mar- in uh, Marin General Hospital in Northern California in summer 2013. That was uh, Richard Ramirez, otherwise known as the Night Stalker. Um, so uh, th- that's about, uh, I think that's enough. Uh, well, you know what, while we're, while we're at it, actually, uh, I think we can include um, Ted Bundy as well for the, for the purposes of, of, this, uh, of, of this show. Why? What is it that we're talking about? What is it that I am finding so very interesting? Uh, I'll tell you what it is. Everybody I've mentioned married while they were in prison. That's right. Um, the Menendez brothers uh, married 
Um, they're both married. One of them is married for the second time. Uh, his first wife divorced him because he was cheating. How? By writing to another woman. But both Menendez brothers are married. Carlos the Jackal, Ilyich Ramirez in prison, life prison in France. He's, uh, he's married to a, a very uh, chic, fancy, upper-class Parisian woman who served as his lawyer, and she's married to him. Um, the, uh, um, uh, the Night Stalker got married. Um, uh, it, 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 it really is very interesting. What, what is going on? And there's no shortage of this. It's, it's unbelievable. So by the way, I did take a look to see how many cases are there of men marrying women, incarcerated women. Um, as far as I can tell, there is only one known case and that was not a woman who was in for life. She she was going to be uh, uh, paroled or released, whatever it was. But as far as guys, there is just no shortage of incarcerated men, life sentences. They're never coming out. Oh, and by the way, uh, in most of these cases, there are no conjugal visits. So forget about it, Right. And yet, what is going on here? So um, it's you, you have no trouble finding these people who are um, who, who these women who are willing to marry guys in jail. Uh, Ted Watson was a member of the Manson family. Remember, they murdered five people, including Sharon Tate. That's years and years ago. Um, and uh, he married a woman. Uh, I mean, the name isn't important. Uh, Ted Bundy, if you don't mind. Ted Bundy married Carol Ann Boone, who he knew before he was arrested. Explain these things, right? I mean, how weird is this? Um, there's a guy called Philip Jablonski, killed five women and um, while he was in prison, married a woman. I told you about Lyle and Eric. Um, Oscar Bolin, also a sentenced to life in prison. And um, a woman called Rosalie Martinez leaves her husband, who was Bolin's lawyer. No, I, you know what? I'm not sure that that's the case. He was a lawyer anyway, but she left her lawyer husband and married Bolin. And so it is, you know, you can do exactly what I did, which just um, look for news on this topic, and there's just no shortage of it. Uh, no shortage. Do you remember a guy called Mark David Chapman? He's serving a, a life a sentence for killing John Lennon. He married, a woman married him while he's in prison. You know, there it is. What do you say to this? Okay, so even you can even grant that maybe maybe these women are all women who just had troubled backgrounds and uh, and uh, ex various difficulties, and maybe that's true. Maybe it isn't. I have absolutely no idea. But but still, where are all the men with troubled backgrounds marrying women who are incarcerated? Now, obviously, there are more men incarcerated than women, but there's plenty of women. And one thing that, that people in criminal justice will tell you is that guys who are in for life, having committed horrible crimes, have no shortage of women who want to uh, visit, who want to write, who want to have a relationship with them. What is going on there? Well, I, I have no answer. I have no definitive answer on this. My only reason for bringing it all up is that these are really bizarre, if not grotesque, cases, and they only happen with women being... All right, there's some interesting theories. One of them is that 
it's safe. It's almost like a lesbian relationship. There's no physical connection. You are providing this vital role. You are the man's link to his family and to the outside world. And and by visiting, you can be the one who's who's bringing him some comfort and some hope. Um, the idea of playing a role in his uh, salvation and his redemption is. Uh, you know, saving him to be to become a good man again. All of the these are all the theories. I I I confess I do not know the answer. I only know that men would not marry a woman they can have no connection with, but women apparently, and and it it may not be if you like average women. It may even not be normal women, although I must say that uh, some of these women have actually been interviewed. Some of them have written books, like the uh, French attorney woman who is married to Carlos the Jackal. Uh, and I got it. I mean, they sound perfectly sane, but I, I know that that is not anything one can absolutely rely on. So um, that is the, the situation. It's weird, but... Anybody who tells you that men and women are exactly the same and that it's just culturation, no. Whether you're talking about France or England, uh, yeah, there's, there's, there's an English case as well. I, f- I found so many of these really bizarre cases. And these guys are really, really dreadful men. Uh, and yet there are these women who are ready and will. They actually do marry them, and they have these little ceremonies. Now, in the case of Ted Bundy, interestingly enough, although uh, there are no conjugal visits allowed, um, he actually managed to get his wife pregnant. Um, And there are theories about how that that was achieved, and apparently this is not that uncommon. Um, the, The prisons are terrible, terrible places, and um, I, I will tell you this, and I've, I've done a show on this uh, a while back. I am so opposed to incarceration that if somebody gave me the option of pressing a button and shutting down all the prisons in America, even though that means that uh, large numbers of criminals, huge numbers of criminals are going to be let out on the streets, uh, I know I know you're going to uh, be shocked and some of you will be disappointed but I would press the button with no hesitation. Um I you know the number of people who come out of jail and who are going to try and commit crimes again um yeah I mean there will be some uh, I would recommend if I'm going to press my button I would like to give the country full warning that uh, in 48 hours I'm releasing everybody from prison. I'm shutting down every jail, prison, and detention center in the country. Uh, Please make sure you're all armed and be ready to protect yourselves. Uh, Go ahead if, uh, you know, shoot without hesitation if you are attacked by by anybody. And, uh, but end of end of uh of prisons so what are you going to do then what about people who are uh, uh convicted of of terrible crimes what are you going to do with them it's very simple um they're either going to be executed and promptly quickly or alternatively they are going to be subjected to lashes how many um a lot 20 30 40 and uh it's it's not going to kill the person. It is going to inflict uh, the most horrendous pain, and uh, doctors will be on standby. Uh, it will leave scars on their back that they will carry for life. That's what I will do. And um, I don't for a moment doubt that this would be a superior criminal justice system. Totally, um, again, I realize this is all in the realm of fantasy, but uh, I am so down on the brutality and cruelty of America's prisons. Uh, I am so down on the very ugly class of people who um, have become the uh, people who work in these systems, who grow eventually to become such ugly people that they inflict cruelty on prisoners for no other reason than that they can, and they they develop a sick enjoyment of cruelty. 
um, I I think that what prison does to families, what it it's it's absolutely horrendous. Uh, what goes on in prisons, the uh, what what is done to to men in prisons, and it's mostly men, obviously. Um, it's absolutely shattering. I would, without hesitation, shut down every single last prison and jail in America if I could, and find other solutions to the problem. I think they're absolutely terrible. But uh, there they are. These uh, men are in jail, and their women ready to marry them. What does that tell us? It tells us, my friends, that men and women are not the same as one another. That's all it tells us. They are very different. And uh, I realize you know that, of course, but um, I I wanted to give some more indications, such as uh, the way we view male concert pianists and female concert pianists and the... uh, the fact that women will marry incarcerated men. Men do not marry incarcerated women. Uh, on our website, rabbidaniellappin.com, uh, please visit, uh, write to us there, let us know what's on your mind. Uh, you can also read the, uh, the columns, uh, archived columns in the in the uh, Thought Tool series, in the Susan's Musing series, in the Ask the Rabbi series. All of them, everything is up there. And uh, you can also subscribe. Make sure you're on the mailing list. Uh, you can um, uh, also find out about... Uh, a lot of people have been asking me about my coaching programs, so we'll have information up there on the uh, on the website as well. And if you find any resources in the store that can enhance your life, as I believe so many can, um, go ahead and at the checkout, use the code WINTER, W-I-N-T-E-R, WINTER, and you will be able to get money off on any of the collections, on any of the sets that we have. And that includes the Income Abundance set, the Genesis Journey set. Um, read. You might want to just browse through because I know you will find resources there that truly can enhance your life. So go for it, rabbidaniellappin.com, www.rabbidaniellappin.com, which takes us as far as we can go for today's show. That means that I, your rabbi, revealing how the world really works, has to finish off, and I have to wish you a week of good times in your faith, in your families, in your friendships, and your finances. I'm Rabbi Daniel Lappin. God bless.